Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, tonight's stay at home lecture. Glad to have you here tonight. Um, I am glad that uh, you all were able to join us tonight. Um, just a um, little bit of uh, housekeeping before we get started tonight. Um, first, um, as you know, as you if you've listened to these some of these lectures before, this is the stay at home lecture. It is sponsored by the the series is sponsored by the Society for the History of Medicine and Health Professions which is the friends group of the Historical Research Center located at UAMS. The Historical Research Center is the only archives in the state that's dedicated to the preservation of the health sciences, the history of the health sciences in Arkansas. And the society uh, helps us achieve our mission uh, in a number of ways, including uh, through the acquisition of materials, the um, the sponsorship of programming such as this, as this, and then we they also sponsor an annual dinner and lecture uh, that we're hoping to have this year um, because it's been canceled for the last two years because of COVID, but we're hoping to have it in October of this year to um, and talk about, have a panel discussion talking about the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Little Rock Internal Medicine Clinic, which was the first integrated medical practice in Arkansas. Uh, it was located here in Little Rock, um, founded in 1970. Um, so it will be a little bit over 50 years now. It was 50 years when we started planning for it. But glad to have everyone here today. Uh, I'd love to show you the Historical Research Center. Um, if you're ever on campus, we're in, located in the Education 2 building, right in the middle of campus in the, in the UAMS library. Love, would love to give you a tour of, and show you some of our artifacts and materials that we have in the collection. And going back to the Society for, for a few minutes, if you're not a member of the Society, I'd encourage you to join. Membership dues are inexpensive, $15 for an individual, $5 for a student if you um, and you don't have to be a student in medical school. You can be a student at any university in the United States or around the world for that matter. So I hope you'll consider joining it. There's a link on the screen, paypal.me slash SHMHP will take you directly to the membership link. Uh, and the membership page is the longer URL that's on your screen right now. Um, as you know, this is the, uh, we have these uh, lectures every, the first Thursday of every month from seven to eight. Next month on September 1st, we're gonna have Rachel uh, Silva Patton back and she'll be talking about the Arkansas Tuberculosis Sanitarium in Boonville and the history of that. Talk about some of the historical, historic properties that are located on the campus and should be an interesting topic. Rachel's always a good speaker. Um, the to join that presentation next month, if you'll you'll use the same link that you use tonight, it's going to stay the same for every stay at home lecture. So I hope you'll join us then, and we'll send out reminders like we usually do. If you're on Facebook, want to uh, receive updates about presentations, uh, you can follow the society on Facebook or and also follow the UAMS Historical uh, Research Center on uh, Facebook as well. Tonight, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Dugan. He is Professor, professor Emeritus of History at Arkansas State University. He started teaching there in 1970 and he retired in 2005, but that has not slowed him down as far as giving presentations. He is just a powerhouse uh, when giving presentations. And tonight he's gonna be talking about three challenges to Arkansas medicine, abortion, malpractice, and pandemics. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Michael, if you want to uh, share your screen. I'm trying to. <laughs> oh, God. Technology will always get you. Uh, that's true. Do you see the share button? No. Do you see the menu? for the Zoom and I have like my minute. Going back, trying to get this to work. Okay. 
Uh, well, as usual, nothing ever works when I get into involved in these things. Uh, here, let me, I'll ask, um, I'm gonna get your video started first. So I just sent you an, uh, a message to start video. And there you are. Do you see the share? Do you see the share screen button on your screen? Uh, no. Do you see the Zoom menu on your screen? I should have known rather to try to do this. <laughs> I believe in you, Michael. I know you can do that. <laughs> uh, well. What, are you on a laptop or on a PC? or what Laptop, yes. Laptop, okay. So do you uh, have- A portion of my face came into view if that's a, <laughs> the slightest- Well, if nothing else, we'll just look wrong. at you while you talk tonight. Uh, why it should be so uh, small, I have absolutely no idea. Move your, uh, move your cursor around the bottom of the screen, see if your menu pops up. Uh, well, let's try again. Well, now why? That doesn't do any good. You still don't see the share uh, button? I do not. Oh, wait, share screen. All right. Wait yeah. a minute. First time this thing finally came up. But it didn't come up with me anywhere around it. So if you click share, you should be able to find your PowerPoint file. Uh, well, let's see if that does anything. Ah. So if you click the green arrow, which I'm not up, getting another anywhere. window should come up. Hmm. So if it if nothing's coming up when you click the arrow, the share screen. Share screen is not there. The share screen's not there? No. Do you want to just, uh, you have your paper, do you want to just read your paper? I'll proceed from this point, and anybody okay. who wants to. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm going I'm to... Far enough back from my, my camera, I'm, at least I can partially be seen. Uh, I'm gonna, you're, you are totally encompassing my, my screen, so you are good to go. <laughs> So I'm gonna turn off my camera. So you're 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 on. Words fail me. <laughs> no, they don't fail me. This is what happens every time I get involved in IT. We'll we'll make it work. You're gonna do a great job. Very good. Here's what we go. The, the great philosopher Isaiah Berlin divided historians into two classes: foxes and hedgehogs. I confess to being a fox with a hedgehog's nose. I could lecture for an hour if digging deeply into each of the three topics we're going to look at. Since I did not know in advance the levels of expertise present in the audience, let me start with an overview. Private health is essentially what happens to you when because of who you are. 
heart disease, diabetes, cancer, etc., are not communicable diseases. Now, I'm not going to say any more about that. Public health is marked by contagion. A 1933 list is valuable here. Diseases included to be dangerous to public health. Anthrax, cholera, chickenpox, diphtheria, meningitis, gonorrhea, hook room, influenza, leprosy, malaria, measles, typhoid, fever, pellagra, plague, smallpox, syphilis, uh, tuberculosis, sorry there, uh, whooping cough, and yellow fever, which is so important in the history of Memphis. All right, we start with two different infecting agents, bacteria and viruses. Associated with bacteria is sanitation. Dogs, cats, and other so-called lower animals do a much better job of dealing with that decaying vegetative matter, which sometimes among the masses is called by a four-letter word, which has ancient Germanic and English derivations. Males throughout Arkansas history, and especially today, often fail to proceed properly. The year is 1869, a landmark. Joseph Lister's antiseptic research showed how to use carbolic acid. Previously, during the Civil War, even after a perfectly normal removal of a battle wound, infections often followed and led to death. A few doctors seemed to sense this and strove to have fresh water and clean bandages changed regularly. Lister's work, along with that of Louis Pasteur, led to the modern usage of the word sanitation. Now, measles, also called rubella, appeared to have started life as an animal virus and became associated with childhood and is spread by respiratory droplets. The rash showed the body's immune system is working. But for those over 20 or under five, complications may result in death. When measles became a reportable disease in 1912, the nation reported 300,000 cases annually and 6,000 measles-related deaths. Recovery resulted in lifelong immunity. And note that sickle cell anemia helps prevent malaria. Poor sanitation was often evident at Camp Nelson in Arkansas. Among its 20,000 20, soldiers in the fall of 1862, measles, mumps, typhoid, and the Camp Diary ran wild. In all, some 1,500 men died. We are accustomed to thinking of the Civil War in terms of battles and leaders. Yet the casualties from both sides amounted to at least 700,000, of which two thirds of which died not from wounds, but from diseases. 2% is a low, and I kid you, low estimate on human losses during the war. By contrast, COVID has only given us 0.2%. By 1900, bacteria could be seen under microscopes. Images of virus did not come until the late 1930s. The new science did not gain universal acceptance. Vaccination dating back to the 18th century prevented smallpox, but it remained a threat in Arkansas into the 19th, into the, well, into, well, the 1930s for that matter. And it took Arkansas's medical doctors, that is to say MDs, 10 years to accept and practice cleanliness. So we move on to the three topics of which we're concerned. Abortion. Giant Totorino's July 16th article, Is Abortion Sacred? in the New Yorker, begins in ancient times. We are going to start in 1869 when Pope Pius IX proclaimed that an abortion at any point in pregnancy was a sin and punishable by excommunication. Therefore, 
largely influenced by the successes of the new medical procedures, the issue began to arise. Federal laws beginning in 1873, known as the Comstack Acts, banned from US mail all, quote, obscene, luvious, or lascivious, immoral, or indecent publications. In Arkansas, the attack on abortion started in 1864 when Dr. E.R. Duval from Fort Smith in a powerful oration called it a bloody monster, an old, ugly, deformed, horrid woman, as well as a scientific gentleman with polite manners, easy grace, and deferential air before performing the deed of murder in the most elegant and scientific manner. And a Little Rock woman abortionist in the 1890s used, quote, methods of sterilizing her instruments that would put an ordinary physician to shame. Well, the following year, the legislature Arkansas legislature made abortion criminal unless done to save the life of the mother. Those done prior to quickening carried a thousand dollar fine and up to five years in jail. Advertising abortion remedies was also illegal, although very hard to find a newspaper that did not run advertisement for penny royal pills or cotton root pills. Not a girl in Texas, we are told, over the age of 15 did not know what tansy pills were used for. Commonly accepted antiabortionists and endomorphics herbs included, but were not limited to, tansy, guana, safflower, scotch broom, rue, angelica, mugwort, worm room, yarrow, essential oil, up, penny royal. The Arkansas case of State versus Reed showed that as written, the law made an unsuccessful attempt at an abortion that was not followed by a death was a felony. But if attempted after quickening, it was merely a misdemeanor. A revised 1890 law also attacked advertisements that promised to restore monthly periods. But advertisers made minor changes in the language that worked just as well. Patent medicine advertisements kept thousands of newspapers alive and came with a red line clause that uh, kept any discussion out of the press. Now, with this, what we have was the advertiser simply making minor changes in language that worked just as well. Patent, medicine, patent medicine advertisement kept thousands of newspapers live and came with a red clause prohibiting any criticism. Many small weeklies survived by selling their inside pages to these uh, quote, toadstool millionaires. The short title of my former Emory professor, James Harvey Young, study of medical advertising prior to the creation of the Federal Drug Administration in 1906. Potential Arkansas women, as I see it, fell into three categories. The first were potential unwed mothers. Second were society leaders for whom too many children cut into their social life. Third, were those whose health required it. In Arkansas in 1900, tuberculosis affected one out of every 60 persons and one seventh of the deaths came from it. An infected woman's life expectancy was two years following the birth of a child. And yet, 
women were farm women were expected to provide the state's labor force and had little say in their lives. A personal story. In response to a political phone call I made in 1972, I got this answer. Well, you'll have to ask my husband. He tells me how to vote. Arkansas doctors were equally at war against contraception as race suicide was seen as undermining white Anglo-Saxon male supremacy. Benton Mills, Dr. Charles H. Cardinal added women's suffrage along with abortions and contraceptives to the evils of the age. Malpractice. In 1881, Dr. Nathan G. Hardister, who studied medicine at Vanderbilt, I say studied because you only attended lectures. The clinical stuff came much later. Uh, was summoned to the bedside of 16-year-old Amanda Saunders. First, he overdosed her on morphine, rendering her nervous, delirious, and retarded her labor pains. Next, he gave her a large quantity of extract of arrogant, normally administered after childbirth. Convulsions followed, so he bled her. Forceps failed to remove the child, but did result in giving her a fever. Using his pocket knife, he did, quote, cut, puncture, penetrate, and wound the said quick child. With his fingers, he attempted to force the head out of the vagina. Failing, he tied a rope around its neck and delivered the baby. He left without cleaning up the afterbirth. She died a week later. He was assisted by Dr. Henry W. Brown who attended the Kentucky School of Medicine at Lexington and who practiced at Evening Shade. The case reached the Arkansas Supreme Court in 1882 and after an extensive legal review of American and British cases, Judge E.H. English held them criminally liable, not for mistakes in justice, but for gross ignorance. Cases of criminal malpractice were rare. Civil suits would become the order of the day. Uh, both doctors went on to have extensive careers, you know, did 60 year old and nothing like that. However, Nate, as uh, Hardister was nicknamed, died of a drug overdose, uh, a major drug overdose in 1910, but Brown lived until 1928. Malpractice suits arose by drawing on the enhanced effectiveness of treatment, just as taking sanitary precautions resulted in less deaths, especially for women. But there was improvement across the board. In the case of Dunham versus Rainey, 1915, it started off to be about a broken leg gone bad. It ended up with this statement. Quote, a physician is only bound to possess and to exercise that degree of skill and learning ordinarily possessed and exercised by members of his profession in good standing, practicing in the same line and in the same general neighbor neighborhood or in similar localities. Eventually, this would be narrowed down to become Arkansas's locality rule. One year later came the first hospital case, Durfree versus Door, 1916. In this case, a young man with a serious liver condition had been operated on, but then left unattended, he got out of bed and fell and fairly injured himself. The hospital at Batesville, was owned by doctors Dorr, Gray, and Johnson. Were they responsible for letting him wander the halls? The Independence County Circuit Court ruled in the favor of the doctors, noting, hell, he's gonna die anyway. A negligence suit, a negligence, negligence suit filed by the father sent the matter back to court. Dangerously, as it turned out in the long run, the hospital wanted to introduce expert witnesses. Oh my God. 
In the early 20th century, medical doctors, MDs, were leaders in promoting public health. By the 1930s, the Arkansas Medical Society members made it all about money. A rich man's union observed BB's country doctor, Dr. E.H. Abington, a longtime legislator who, by the way, wrote a law uh, requiring a junior college at BB, and it's still there under different names. At the same time, in order to protect the confession, profession, a conspiracy of silence arose and became so evident that even the state Supreme Court took a jur official judicial notice of it in Graham v. Cisco in 1970. No local doctor would ever testify against another. And nurses were never supposed to criticize a doctor or e even if he was cutting off the wrong leg or removing the wrong organ. Yet, as victory seemed to have been won, a fire broke out. Betty Schmidt went into Little Rock's Baptist Medical Center for for a tractotomy. And after a blue flame shot out of her lung, she subsequently died. My goodness. In Schmidt versus Gibbs, the court restored res ipsa loquitur. In the law, we mostly work in Latin and I won't go into that, but the thing stands for itself. It's visibly obvious. A jury could see for itself that catching fire was unacceptable. Other cases would follow and observed Justice Tom Clay's, there is no locality rule under the child abuse reporting statutes. Malpractice began to turn up in unexpected places. Facts. Bob McAdams took his dog to a veterinarian for a shot. When he went to pick up the dog six hours later, the dog could not walk. The dog's condition declined severely. And the dog died within a year. This is McAdams versus Fault from 2002. He was unsuccessful first in getting to declare his, his dead dog, Mr. Uh, T, Excuse me there why I dropped all my papers to make a, a very powerful statement. Uh, and uh, a plaintiff in the case asking that an amount of no less than $50,000 be paid in Mr. T's name to the Pulaski County Humane Society. Well, the judgment of the circuit court was affirmed as to its dismissal of the complaint as it denied to the dog as a plaintiff in a pro se complaint. But the judgment of the circuit court was reversed as to its dismissal on the complaint with respect to the pet owner. The case was remanded to circuit judge. You're not going to stop old Bob, I'll tell you. He was a real character. I've heard some stories about him, but, you know, we can't talk about that now. Then returned with an expert witness in 2006, McAdams versus Kuhlman. He refiled alleging malpractice, res ipsa loquitur, and the tort of outrage, all based on the same allegations of facts. In short, the appellate asserted that his dog never walked again after that January 14, 2000 visiting, and the paralysis caused premature organ failure and death. McAdams lost in the decision handed down by Judge John B. Robbins, but Judge Karen Baker, who had heard the first case, dissented in the second. Quote, it is possible that a choke collar caused his ultimate demise. I am, oh, you missed my great gesture on the choke, choke collar. Sorry about that. I, 
I am aware that this case involves the loss of a 17 year old dog. Common sense tells us that the loss of this pet was inevitable, perhaps even imminent. Despite this, our legislation has mandated the application of our medical malpractice laws to the practice of veterinary medicine, precluding us from relying on the general premise that old dogs die. Furthermore, this case is before us on appeal from a grant of summary judgment motion. Our procedures and case law dictate that the trial court's duty is to review the proceedings, discovery and responses and evidence presented to determine whether the moving party is entitled to judgment and evidence presented to determine as a matter of law. Our responsibilities to review the trial court's decision is no less onerous. Unfortunately, the majority's analysis fails this obligation. This is not the end of dead dogs. In Zepeki versus Arkansas Metner Veterinary Medical Examining Board, Trish Marciano's dog, Nikki, dialed while under Sepeti's care, again, being unable to walk. Now, this is a case before the licensing board, and it turned on record keeping and even the use of a chiropractor whom the veterinarian did not observe. But, when the dog owner went public about the death of her dog, Sepeki sued her for slander in federal district court in Fort Smith. And the case was ultra, ultimately resolved by a $3,000 payment. I would say with regard to all of this, that when we consider the full implications there are more yet to come. Third pandemic. The 1918 influenza pandemic. The arrival of Coriovanus, COVID-19 in 2020, shared many similarities with the pandemic of 1918. Between 1918 and 1919, approximately 670,000 Americans died, more than the total casualty from World Wars I and II, Korea and Vietnam. Worldwide, 50 million lives were lost. A virus, probably from farm animals, emerged in rural Kansas in 1915 and continued to mutate. In late January and early February of 1918, a country doctor in Haskell County, Kansas, reported an unusual break, an outbreak that did not follow la grippe, the common cold. That had a U pattern infecting most the very young and the very old. Instead, this one had a W pattern, if you can see my gesture there, uh, hitting healthy, young, and middle-aged persons. He reported to public health officials, but they were ignored. To be reported, a disease had to be on the official classification list and La Grippe, the common cold, was not coded. However, following US entry into the Great War, Camp Funston on the grounds of Fort Riley, Kansas, opened with 56,000 trainees, including some from Haskell County. A county cook became the first recorded case of what later would be identified as H1N1 influenza A virus. More than a thousand were hospitaled in three weeks, but only 38 died. The war was underway and Congress had passed the Sedition Act suppressing news. Hence, it was only in May when the Spanish newspapers recorded the King and Prime Minister took sick, did it become the Spanish flu. Meanwhile, transfers Transferred soldiers spread it all over the country and into France. 
The first outbreak was seeming to die away on its own in late uh, spring, actually evolved into something more deadly. New outbreaks in August came at Camp Divine near Boston and in France and Sierra Leone. The W pattern, doing my W's again here if I can, uh, still prevailed. And as a Divine Camp doctor reported, the young soldiers developed pneumonia, quote, of a type that has never been seen. Within two hours of admission, they had monogamy spots, spots on their cheekbones. And a few hours later, begin to see cyanosis turning blue, extending from the ears and spreading all over the face. Delirium, le 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 delirium, lethargy and protestation followed from bleeding from the nose and ears. The coughed up blood resembled tomato puree. Death often came within hours. The death toll there was 757. Arkansas's military base was Camp Pike. Its population of 52,000 made it the second largest city in Arkansas. On September 23rd, 1918, the same month, by the way, that my father's fiance died in New York City, the camp reported its first case. Within five days, 754 men were sick, and by the end of the month, 7,000 were infected. On October 3rd, the post commander ordered first a partial, then complete quarantine. But <laughs> the infirmary was so overwhelmed that the sick were sent to the barracks. Now, historian Kim Allen Scott observed, the more effective method of ensuring the spread of disease could hardly be imagined. Yet, the Army continued to send new recruits to the camp. The undertaking firm had to refrain from releasing information to the press. A 1919 study, which is probably all false, concluded that 13,892 men fell ill and 468 died at camp, which led the deaths among military camps in the United States. And at the University of Arkansas, an outbreak hit the student army trading car. Lieutenant Lawrence Brooks Hayes was infected but recovered. And the university nurse, Ma Harden, was even compensated by the federal government for her hard work. That infuriated university president, J.C. Futrell, who demanded that she turn the money over to the university. That, in turn, prompted a student revolt against the president, and Brooks Hayes and other supporters were expelled. The Arkansas State Board of Health, created only in 1913, initially did nothing since the disease was not on the list of 20 diseases subject to quarantining. There were provisions for adding to the list, but Dr. Charles W. Garrison, its head, <laughs> was facing hope and rebellion just to trying to get students vaccinated against typhoid. Dr. Jacob C. Geiger, U.S. Public Health Officer in Arkansas, said that the outbreak was simple, plain, old-fashioned like grip. Even into October, he assured the Arkansas Gazette. Situation still well in hand. By that time, Little Rock and North Little Rock were reporting 506 cases. Geiger declared that a quarantine was both unwise and unnecessary. And two days later, we had 1,800 cases. Other reports came from Newport, Wilmot, Hot Springs, Stuttgart, Walden, Subiaco, Paris, Hunter, and Derma, and finally, the State Board of Health acted. Meanwhile, one of the casualties was Geiger's wife. The quarantine charged parents with keeping under the age of 18 off the streets. A congregation of people was banned, thus closing schools, churches, and public meetings. Residents were urged to attend to their business and stay at home. Farmers were told to leave town and not come back. Funerals were limited to immediate family members, preachers, and pallbearers. Masks were common, 
but not mandates, although Dr. Garrison considered that option. Finally, doctors were required to report cases daily. And I would say to this, well, this could be done in towns and other things. The number that died in rural areas is basically unknown. On October 25th, the relaxing, the quarantine began by permitting church services and colleges to reopen. Public schools remain closed and children are still to remain at home. Next came letting stores be open on Saturday evenings. That, of course, was the busiest, busiest shopping day of the week, although at that time, and pool halls could be reopened. Anecdotal evidence suggests that many had already disregarded these rules. Finally, on November 4th, the quarantine ended. Drug stores saw an increase in business. Goose Pepto Mandan advertised itself as a red blood builder that would, quote, fortify your body against the Spanish influenza. Hot Springs Microzone, previously marketed to fight syphilis, promised an absolute antidote. Well, Dr. James Cathara Oil promised to prevent it. Medical doctors saw resemblance to, marira, to uh, malaria and so prescribed a daily dose of quinine. Af, after adding caramel, the combination become, became that good old Arkansas style. Although there were attempts at creating a vaccine, that goal would not be reached until 1940. By contrast, St. Louis, home to Jefferson Barracks, where 200,000 enlistees passed through, recorded its first days on October 1st. The doctor and city government performed effectively and infection and death rates were below national averages. Armistice Day, November 11th, came and massive celebrations in the streets followed, but the plague continued into the winter. And in parts of the state, so many were ill that at the time of the November election, a few polls never opened. And elsewhere, people failed to fear to venture out to vote, thus gradually reducing the turnout and dooming the proposed new constitution, which would have been a great improvement to Arkansas, because most of our constitutions are pretty disastrous. In central Arkansas, at least some of, of every four persons were sick. The new tuberculos tuberculosis sanitarium at Boonesville quarantined itself and avoided the epidemic, but the town refused to act. Five doctors at Fort Smith and Fayetteville died. Influenza did not invade the South until late November, and then Pine Bluff suffered a second outbreak. Dr. Garrison even briefly considered a statewide quarantine. The disease continued into 1919, but even in 1920, cases reported in Conway. In time, the influenza outbreak was celebrated in poetry and song. For children, there was this, I had a little bird. Its name was Insa. I opened the window and in flew Insa. Music in court of 1930 recording, Memphis Blue, with Elder D.R. Curry pounding the piano to the choir of the Oakley Street Church of God in Jackson, Mississippi. Another version, which you can actually hear the words, came in 1939 at the Clement State Farm in Graziola, Texas. So, what do we get from all of this? Well, I'm going to have to close. Because can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I'm sorry. While we're waiting, I just might comment about the origin of the word influenza. The uh, In the Middle Ages, they continued to have these outbreaks of influenza. And uh, it was thought that the arrangement of the stars, the constellation, influenced uh, and brought it on. And the, word, the stars influenced uh, this outbreak and the word influenza derived from the concept that it, that it was arranged by the constellation of the stars. Oh, that's interesting. I've never heard that before.
Well, I think uh, Dr. Dugan has gotten back in. And we're going to see if he can. Michael, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Michael? <laughs> can you hear us? I think I can, if you can hear me. I can, we can hear you now. We can't see you yet, but we can. Uh... <laughs> the uh, the uh, Beagle Pup seems to have done major damage in all corrections, <laughs> <laughs> including unplugging the computer. And, uh, and he had to, he had to uh, uh, go through two doors I had pre previously shut in order to do this. So it's, uh, uh, yes, okay. Do you want to continue? Uh, what I would do, actually, I, the, the only one thing I didn't get done. Can we do that? Sure, sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you heard this or not, uh, but we had poetry. I had a little bird, my name was Enza. I opened the window in influenza. And then secondly, there is a song called Memphis Flu. And there are two recordings of this, one with Elder D.R. Uh, Curry uh, and uh, the Oakley Street Church of God of Christ in Jackson, Mississippi. And you can, this is all on YouTube. You can, you can find it. Uh, you won't be able to understand the word they sang, but it is interesting. And then uh, uh, Lomax at, uh, at Clement State Farm in uh, Braziosa, Mississippi, recorded a second version by Ace Johnson, which is understandable. So anyone who's interested in this uh, should, should look at that. Now I would say only one thing further as to uh, what I have said about some of these items and then we'll open it up for conversation. But uh, one of the, I would say major, I would consider this a major issue, uh, issue uh, in involving malpractice that I didn't get into and don't intend to get into extends to the case of Martha uh, Bull, who was in a nursing home and was left to die unattended, which prompted a lawsuit, which, imprompted, which prompted the bribery of a judge which is one of the major scandals of Arkansas history's judicial system. And my conclusion on all of this uh, is, is very simple because as I say, I didn't want to get into uh, any modern or, or recent issues, but what is it? Well, as my mother always said, well, my late mother, well, puke, buzzard, puke. And so at this point, uh, I will endeavor to field questions, even if all the dog is attacking my foot. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, let me let's get this. And um, if anyone has any questions, feel free. If you want to just um, uh, unmute yourself and um, and uh, ask your question that way. You're free to do that, or you can use the chat feature, whatever is easier for you. If you're having trouble to unmuting, if you'll just sort of raise your hand uh, on Zoom, then I'll uh, I'll be use the emoji raise you, raising your hand, and then I can unmute you from my end. Have you, uh, Michael, uh, talking about the 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 influenza pandemic, there's, there was that um, poem, I think it was from a preacher in Fort Smith. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, about the, 
turning away from evil ways. That's uh, it. Uh, yes, that's that's it. exactly of the two songs. Uh, okay. I, I didn't I didn't give his name. Uh, I, I struck that out of, in the basis of time. But that's the, the words on those two songs. Okay. okay. And, yes, and uh, uh, to quote them, which I. It was God's mighty hand. He is judging this old land. North and south, east and west can be seen. Yes, he killed the rich and poor. And he's going to kill some more if you don't turn away from shame. But, you know, again, I don't want to sound relativistic, but we had a uh, letter in the Jonesboro Sun, I think it was last year, uh, I don't have to worry about COVID because I believe in God. And, and this is the nearest thing I have to that out of the uh, influenza outbreak. And, and again, you know, I, I, I didn't, uh, as I say, any of these three can be expanded tremendously. But I have a story about all of the uh, wagons uh, carrying corpses, uh, carrying uh, caskets out to the Macedonia secret, uh, cemetery north of town. Uh, mm. And the, the grave diggers couldn't keep up. And I think it's important to know that we really don't know, as I said earlier, the real casualties from this. We, we get what's reported. And what's reported is in, in Arkansas is never the real Arkansas. Right, right. We do have a question uh, from um, Andrea Cantrell, who um, uh, is former uh, reference or research services librarian at, at UA Special Collections. In your research, have you come across any references to home demonstration club members assisting during the 1918-1918 or 1918-1919 flu pandemic? No, but that's a very that is a topic worth. Uh, I mean, we know, uh, 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 I've, I've seen elsewhere records, uh, mentions, neighbors helping neighbors in, in these situations. And that would seem to have been a, a, uh, a logical development of that. And uh, it's probably something that, that needs lurking, uh, uh, looking at. A dog is trying to bite me. <laughs> All right, Henry Clay, you wanted your moment on the screen. <laughs> That's his, his moment in the spotlight. Yeah. Okay, Henry Clay, you're going to go down now. Uh, well, you know, talking about the uh, extension homemakers, um, you know, they, uh, they would have groups of, of women who would make masks uh, to be shipped out. And that seems like a perfect project yeah. for extension homemakers. Yeah. And uh, I, I found more reference to masking in Missouri. There, there, for those who, who want to pursue this, there are two articles in Missouri Medicine that came out uh, before, and this is important, uh, before COVID hit. Uh, they, were they were recording uh, two phases of how things happened and how they responded. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's always valuable to have uh, information that's not, what would I say, contaminated by modernism, mm -hmm. uh, by what's happening today. And, and both of these came out before. And, and uh, I communicated with some of the doctors involved in this, and they had many of the same experiences uh, that I did. Uh, my father's fiance, uh, B. Heaton, I have pieces of her artwork around here, uh, died. She was an art student in, uh, in New York City. And uh, uh, later on, her, her, uh, her sisters passed on some of this and I ended up with it. Uh, it's China painting mostly. But uh, if you look up the Heaton, H-E-A-T-O-N, house in the Oak Show, this was the major mansion uh, in, in the town. Mm. And, and this was not a minor matter when, when the daughter died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of simula similarities between COVID and, and uh, the 1918 flu pandemic. It's just kind of eerie. Uh, of the of the uh, similarities between the two. 
Well, you know, and the interesting thing, again, the major point is, uh, I found no relevance to the politicians ever intervening in any of this. Mm -hmm. Now, there was association and assistance in St. Louis, but I did not find anybody anywhere in Arkansas saying, close all this, we're, we know this is all a joke. I mean, uh, the Dr. Geiger story is the only one I've got of mm -hmm. a, a belated response to this. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, the uh, state senator from uh, Craighead County, uh, Dan Sullivan, in, back in June of last year, ordered, ordered unilaterally on his own everything open. And uh, the, the interference with politicians in this and the politicalization of medicine. Uh, we have a, a, a pending constitutional amendment, for instance, uh, that would, as I see it, allow anyone for any religious reason to reject anything for themselves or their children. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was interesting on that point because uh, I, I did a, a, a piece a little back on uh, trachoma, blindness, and blindness was a big issue in the Ozarks uh, and across Appalachia. Why? Because people didn't practice sanitation, so they wiped venereal disease, chlamydia, into their eyes mm -hmm. and blinded them, their children. Mm -hmm. So what's the result? You get laws passed, and I'm not even, I could not find Arkansas on this point at all, but I certainly had Missouri from 1955, that you have the doctors, anyone treating had to, uh, treat the eyes with uh, silver nitrate was the earliest, but others uh, came up uh, uh, later on to, to uh, re replace it. So uh, are we going to repeal that? Uh, where are we headed? Uh, That's a good question. Freedom? We have another well, question. We have another of the speech. Uh, you, your questions have raised this, and so now I have an open forum to say, uh, well, pute, both are pute. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question uh, from Mary Evans here in Little Rock. Uh, could you speak to, uh, about Camp Pike, officials at Camp Pike trying to keep young girls away from the GIs with, uh, to prevent STIs, STDs, things like that? Oh, that... Uh, yeah, there's a good deal of information. On what they were trying to do was keep away from Fort Smith because uh, the other major problem they had down there was syphilis. <laughs> and uh, boys will be boys. And, uh, uh, there, you know, there were more diseases uh, at, at work in this context. And uh, Fort Smith was known as the syphilis capital of, of America. And, and that's another story. <laughs> if you want me to get into that, uh, I, I will only say this in, in, in passing: that uh, sex education uh, in in forts in the in Hot Springs required uh, taking the kids uh, down to the syphilis center and, and uh, showing them the pictures and the people and the like and the infectations. It was supposed to uh, uh, scare the semen out of them. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that 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 was that was a major issue in the camp's history because mm -hmm. that was part of the legacy of uh, Hot Springs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think we're 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 at eight o'clock. So thank you, Michael, for this informative presentation. Even though you didn't have your PowerPoint, you still did a great job. I appreciate it. Did we ever get up the picture of the uh, of of the family? Uh, I can put it up right quick if I can find it. I don't even know if I can find it. Okay. No, I, I can't. Let me just say in passing what we have. This, this is from uh, Ozark County, uh, Missouri. And it's uh, a mother and her children and uh, what she got. to birth. She'd been uh, identified with tuberculosis. And two years later, she was dead. And so was her husband. And I have not yet found out the fate of the three children. Mm -hmm. Um, lots of interesting medical history in Arkansas, lots of tragic um, medical history, uh, not just in Arkansas, but across the U.S. So yeah. uh, thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. It's all, you're always an entertaining speaker. 
uh, even when your power doesn't go out. Uh, but thank you for being here and thank you all for joining us tonight. Hope you'll join us next month on September 1st for Rachel Patton and she'll be talking about the Arkansas tuberculosis, tuberculosis sanitarium. So uh, thank you all, y'all be safe. Michael, thank you again and we'll see you soon.